Well, hey, Pathway. Hey. Hey. It's great to be with you. My name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and I'm just so excited to be able to share with you today. I'm excited to be able to kick off this new series called Unleashed. We're going to spend just a few weeks together talking about this, and, and we'll unpack more of that as the morning continues, but it's just good to be with you. I really want to just dive in today with a story that is a little bit depressing. It's not going to make anyone cry or anything. It's just a little bit depressing. It's, but it's actually a very interesting story about a guy named Christopher Knight. And this story was published in a National Geographic article just last week. But it's been around for a few years. I don't, maybe you've heard of the North Pond Hermit. Uh, Christopher Knight was this kid. He grew up in a, in a home, kind of an average American family. He was the youngest of five kids. But at the age of 20, back in 1986, at the age of 20, Christopher Knight got in his car, left his home in Massachusetts, drove north, headed into Maine, parked his car, left his kids, or his keys, he didn't have any kids, but he left his keys in the car, the story would have gotten really interesting at that point, but left his keys in the car and wandered into the woods there in central Maine where he decided just to kind of set up a camp and live by himself for 27 years. And for 27 years by himself, zero interactions with any other human beings through the course of that time, but he managed to commit roughly a thousand burglaries. Because this is really interesting, because evidently he was trying to get away from society, he wanted to be by himself, but he found this this campsite, this plot of ground in a very densely wooded area, very rugged and rocky terrain and all this, but it was on private property. It was actually surrounded by camps and retreats and other cabins and residents and things like that, and so from time to time, in fact, Pretty frequently, if he needed food or if he needed other supplies, clothing, books, whatever, he would just let himself into his neighbor's homes. When they weren't there, he'd pick their locks and just let himself in and take their stuff. And so for 27 years, this was going on. And they had no, I mean, think about the residents living in this area, this part of central Maine. They had no idea who or what was taking their stuff. But every so often, every season, they would come back to their cabin, they'd come back to their retreat, and they would find stuff missing. And so they began, this, this legend began to grow, this legend of the North Pond Hermit. They gave this guy a name because they had no idea who he was or what he was. And so the North Pond Hermit, for 30 years, almost 30 years, and finally this game warden who lived in the area decided, enough is enough. We've got to get to the bottom of this. We've got to figure out what's going on, who's taking our stuff. And so he set up some surveillance equipment, and they discovered Christopher Knight was the North Pond Hermit. They found his campsite there in this, I mean, incredibly rugged terrain where he had lived for 27 years amassing all their stuff. They found it there. And they asked him why. They confronted him and they said, Chris, why did you do this? Not just why did you take our stuff, but why did you leave your home? Why did you leave your family? Why did you live your life in solitude like this? And really, he didn't have an answer. He just said, I just never really fit in. I just never really fit in. And so Christopher Knight, contrary to some of our assumptions, He's not a crazy person. He's not clinically insane. He's not a violent person. As he broke into these homes, he never damaged anything, never broke a pane of glass, never damaged anything. He's not a religious zealot. Like he's, He wasn't on some quest to find himself or to find God. But Christopher Knight chose the life of a hermit simply because this world just didn't have a place for him. Or so he believed. And as I look at this story, there's really a fascinating side to this. I mean, I, I'm really kind of intrigued, and I'm, I'm actually kind of impressed. Like, this guy lived for 27 years in the woods by himself. Think about the winters in central Maine and how harsh that would have been. And this guy never lit a fire because that would have given his location away. He just, he, but he managed to survive somehow. He never had any kind of frostbite or anything. I'm impressed. I mean, the locals would have said, this guy was wicked smart, right? I mean, he had some intelligence. He had some skills. But then there's another side to this story that's just kind of tragic. Because think about thousands of days on end living alone, dozens of years of his life just wasted, living in solitude. And I share that story to kind of get things started this morning because I believe that it reveals kind of a tragic outcome to a journey that all of us find ourselves on, this journey of trying to find our place in this world. I mean, none of us want to just exist, right? None of us just want to survive from day to day, but we want to know that our lives matter. We want to know that our lives can count for something. And I really believe that there are two driving questions that all of us will come back to through the course of our lives. We'll circle back to these again and again. The question is, does my life really matter? And can my life count for something greater? A few months ago, my son Gibson, he's 10 years old, 
just out of nowhere, was obsessed with playing soccer. Now, we had signed him up for soccer back when he was five. He kind of did the upward sports thing, and, and, uh, and he just didn't really seem to have that much interest in it, and so we didn't bother to put him back into it every year. We just kind of, and he didn't seem to mind. So until this year, 10 years old, all of a sudden he just started talking about playing soccer. And so we signed him up, and he's playing St. Joe's soccer this year, and after his first practice, as we were driving home, I just, out of curiosity, I just say, hey, Gibson, what made you want to play soccer? What was it about soccer that made you suddenly so interested in playing this year? And his response really surprised me. I mean, I kind of thought his response would be something like, you know, well, my friends and I have been playing it at school, and it's a lot of fun, or I saw some older kids playing it, and it kind of inspired me. I want to be like them. But his response really had nothing to do with any of that. In fact, it didn't really have anything to do with soccer specifically. But when I asked him, he just said, well, Dad, I just wanted to be part of a team. I just want to be part of a team. And in that moment, my 10-year-old son, just in a very transparent and honest moment, revealed, in some sense, his search for a place in this world. Trying to find his place in this world. And I think Gibson was actually onto something because I think all of us in some level want to be part of a team. Because on a team, we know that our lives can matter. And as part of a team, we know that our lives can count for something bigger than us. I think all of us are on some sort of search for significance, and that search for significance can take us down many paths, I mean, in all kinds of different directions. But the central truth behind everything that we're going to talk about together today is true for all of us here. It's true for those who are watching online. It's true for those upstairs in the venue as well. And it's our big idea today, and we're going to come back to this again and again throughout our course of our discussion, but it's the big idea that God has a place for you on his team. God has a place for you on his team. And I believe that the answers to life's driving questions can be found in Ephesians 2.10. And I want to look at that together with you today. We're really going to camp here today. And uh, we're going to be looking at this out of the New Living Translation. And that's a little bit different for us here, Pathway. Uh, but I really like the language and the, and the wording that they chose in this. And so we're going to use this translation today. But here's what it says in Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Now there is so much packed into this passage. If you take the first 10 verses out of chapter 2 in Ephesians, I mean, we could really just spend weeks unpacking the rich theological truth in these 10 verses, even if we just look at this verse here. But I just want to very simply today, for our purposes together today, I just want to draw out what I believe are two game-changing truths about you that we find here in Ephesians 2.10. And the first game-changing truth about you is that you are God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. I mean, we just literally take this right out of the New Living Translation and how they worded this. You are God's masterpiece, for we are God's masterpiece. And if you look at the original language here, the word that they use for masterpiece is the word poema. It's a Greek word. It's actually the word where we get our word for poem. And as we look at different translations and how they handle this passage, you'll find it used a couple of different ways. Most often it's used as workmanship. It's also used as handiwork. Uh, In one case or a couple of cases, it's actually used as a work of art. But here in the New Living Translation, we find it, of course, used the wording masterpiece to get closer to the heart of the meaning in this passage. And I love that. I mean, think about a masterpiece. A masterpiece is a work of outstanding skill, artistry or workmanship, it's an artist or craftsman's best piece of work. And so for me, when I began to think about masterpieces, there was all kinds of imagery that that started to come to mind. I mean, I immediately thought of Michelangelo's frescoes on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. I mean, just an incredible masterpiece, a work of art that spanned years for him to complete. And I'm just curious, has anyone actually been to the Sistine Chapel? Uh, awesome. Some of you have. That's awesome. I would love to go someday. You just see that firsthand, that incredible work of art. Uh, another masterpiece that I thought of was J.R.R. Tolkien's literary masterpiece, The Lord of the Rings Trilogy. And I'm kind of outing myself here for the nerd that I am, but I love, I mean, if you've read that, you are well aware of just the vast and imaginative worlds that he created and the people in them and the backstories that span generations and ages. And this guy actually invented languages and alphabets for the people and the locations in his story. It's incredible. It's a masterpiece. And of course, as as I thought about masterpieces, my mind sort of drifted to the maple pepper bacon flatbread at Granite City. (laughs) 
that's a culinary masterpiece. It is hard to say. You really have to read the menu, and I had to practice that a lot just to get that out, but it is a culinary masterpiece. I mean, think about masterpieces. In some way, they capture our hearts. They capture our attention in some ways. And, and if we apply that thinking now to what Paul is telling us here, we are God's masterpiece, his crowning achievement. And I believe that knowing this helps us understand just how deeply valued we are to God and really how God, who God created us to be. And we begin to understand Uh, and appreciate, um, we begin to see our value to God and appreciate this when we understand the work that he did for us. And what Paul does in the first few verses of chapter 2 here is he kind of takes us on a flashback tour. And we go back to verse 2, 1, um, chapter 2, verse 1. Look what he says here. He says, once you, and of course he's writing this letter to the Ephesians, The, the apostle Paul is writing this letter to the Ephesians, and, and, and he's writing this to the church in Ephesus, but really this is to the church at large. And so this applies to all of us. And he says that once you were dead, not physically dead, of course, but spiritually dead, separated from God, far from him, as he explains, because of your disobedience and your many sins. And so really, in the first three verses here in chapter 2, Paul teaches us that all of us have an inclination to sin. A natural inclination to sin. And this really echoes what he wrote in a different letter to the church in Rome, where he says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so this is a problem that we all share. It's a cursed condition that has been passed down from generation to generation since creation. And so I think for for us to really grasp what Paul is trying to set up here, we just need to own this truth that we are all sinners. And that's not just based on what we do. That's actually really just who we are. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And now some of you are probably thinking, well, wow, you know, a second ago I was feeling great. You were calling me God's masterpiece, and now you're just calling me a a sinner. And some of you are probably sitting there thinking, wow, hey, buddy, take it easy. Listen, I'm not a terrible person. I paid my taxes last week. I've never uh, killed anyone that I'm aware of. You know, I recycle every other week, and I sponsor a Haitian. So, So cut me some slack here, buddy. We do, good, we do good things, right? And we feel good about those things. And yet what Paul tells us is that it's deeper than this. Those good things are great, but what's going on beneath the surface? And Paul tells us, he tells us it's not even the big things that we have to worry about. We're not checking off this list saying, well, at least I didn't murder someone. At least I didn't rob a bank, you know? But he tells us that it's any and every moment of disobedience. That moment when we decide, God says, go this way, and we say, no, I want to go this way. God says, well, you should probably, I want you to do this, this is what I called you to do. No, I, I think I want to do this thing instead. It's our disobedience, Paul says. It's our disobedience that has pulled us, pulled us further and further away from God. It's killed us spiritually, and it's made, made us all deserving of God's anger. And because God is holy and because God is just, he just can't overlook our sin. He can't look at us and say, well, they're trying hard. They're really doing the best they can. You know, I like them, I love them, and I created them, and so I'm just going to cut them a little slack. I'm going to overlook these things. God can't do that. The, the Bible tells us that the wages of our sin is death. And that penalty is ours. That penalty has to be paid. And then we get to verse 4. And we find this very encouraging conjunction, the first two words there, but God. But God is so rich in mercy. And, he's, and he loved us so much that as John 3.16 tells us, he sent his one and only son. <clears throat> he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So there we were, lost in our sin, uh, spiritually dead, but God sent Jesus, his only son, to die on the cross in our place. And there on the cross, our sin debt was paid in full. Now think about that. Think about the cost that was paid for our salvation. Someone would only pay a cost that dear for a masterpiece they truly treasured. God did a work for you on the cross because you're precious to him. And the undercurrent of truth that's really running between the lines of all of this is that You matter. Your life really matters. 
because you are God's masterpiece and he has paid dearly to make a place for you on his team. And so not only do we begin to see our value to God when we look at the work that he's done for us, but we begin to see who God made us to be when we look at the work that he's doing in us. And so we get a little bit further into verse 10 here in chapter 2, and he says, he, it says not only are we God's masterpiece, but he has created us anew in Christ Jesus. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. God has done a work for us in Jesus Christ, and Paul briefly reminds us that God is doing a new work in us. And something he touches on a little bit more intently as you look at verses 5 and 6 here in chapter 2, not only did Christ rescue us, but his resurrection power has raised us from spiritual death to new life in him. And if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Once we become followers of Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes residence in our lives. That's what Ron talked about last week. He takes residence within us, and now we begin to see the world and the people in it differently. The old you is gone, and the new you has a new view. Because the Holy Spirit is at work within you. He is transforming you from the inside out, renewing you day by day. And now we simply cannot overlook the problems that we see in our homes and in our city and in this world. And this changes our priorities. As new creations, we open up our lives to interruptions because we begin to see people as Jesus sees them. We realize that our lives were bought with a price, and it compels us to live more sacrificially, giving more of our time and our talents more freely in service to others. We live with a heightened sense of awareness of the brokenness in this world, and it begins to break our hearts as it breaks God's. And this is actually an important way that God awakens us to the passion that's within us. I read a book recently by John Ortberg, and if you don't know who John Ortberg is, he's, he's, just, he's a well-known pastor out in California, and he's written lots of books, and I really just appreciate the way he teaches and the way he writes, but, but um, in this book, All the Places to Go, um, he says that in a very important way, each of us will be defined by our problem. Each of us will be defined by our problem, and, the pre- and his premise is that the size of your problem, the problem that's occupying you, the size of that problem reflects the size of your soul. I wouldn't dare stand up here and judge the size of your soul, okay? I don't know many of you well enough, and that just sounds kind of weird anyway. But I want to share some of his thoughts with you and, and just kind of let you decide for yourself what's going on and what, what, he's, what he's saying to us here. Because in his book, he writes, if you can choose, if you want to, to devote your life to the problem of how can I be rich or how can I be successful or how can I be healthy or problems like how to make our lives more convenient, or how to put an irritating neighbor in his or her place, how to make wrinkles less visible, how to cope with cranky coworkers or or lack of recognition. Or we can allow the Holy Spirit to awaken us to other problems we see around us. He says problems like how to extend or how to how to end extreme poverty, how to stop sex trafficking, how to help at risk children receive a great education, how to bring beauty and art to a city. Small people, Ortberg writes, are occupied by small problems. But people who live with largeness of soul are occupied by large problems. So as God begins to stir within you, opening your eyes and breaking your heart to the bigger God-sized problem around you, this will become something extremely personal to you. It will move you to tears. It'll keep you awake at night. It'll have you pounding the table until something is done. And you'll say to yourself, we have to do something. And you might discover in that moment that in that problem, you have found a passion. And God wants to unleash that passion for his glory and for his church. So, what's your problem? Seriously, what's your problem? Why don't you just turn to somebody next to you and ask them, what's your problem? (laughs) Try to to find somebody you don't know that well. That'll make it just a little bit more awkward you are God's masterpiece with the unique passion that he has awakened within you and God has a place for you on his team a place where your passion can be unleashed for his glory and for his church and so the first game changing truth that we find here in Ephesians 2.10 is that you are God's masterpiece but the second one is this well I'll just tell you oh here it is I 
have work to do. You have work to do. We move a little further into, uh, into this verse here, in verse 10. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. And as we look at this, this verse, most translations, when you read this verse in most translations, it refers to these good things as good works, which are simply acts designed specifically to benefit others. And these works, as Paul reminds us, are not our means to salvation. In fact, in, in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he very clearly states that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so we're not saved by works, but we are saved for works. Our good deeds become, as one theologian put it, the, the consequence and evidence of our salvation. And so you see, if, and here's another way to look at this. There is just no way that Jesus Christ can come into our lives. There's no way that we can feel the full force and experience the full force of that grace and it not somehow flow out of us in good works. And now Paul is really bringing the gospel full circle here. God has done a work for you. He's doing a work in you. And now we begin to understand his purpose in this because God wants to do a work through you. And what's more, God has already pre-planned these good works for you to do. He's already created the opportunities for us. He's already pre-supplied the power for you to do them. And all we need to do is simply surrender ourselves to the work that God wants to do through us. And it's in this understanding that we come face to face with the reality that our lives have purpose. Our lives have purpose, and the undercurrent of truth running between the lines of all of this is that your life can count for something greater. Because your life has purpose. And I believe that our purpose in God really has two parts to it. And so the first part of it is, is, is this right here, that there's a work that God has called you to do. There's a work that God has called you to do. You know, part of this longing to find our place in this world really comes down to just a need to know that our lives have purpose. And so often we find our purpose in the work that we do. And it's really interesting how longer life expectancies are now changing the way that we look at things specifically in light of our purpose. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but people are just living a lot longer these days. And really that's because of advancements in healthcare and Chipotle restaurants, because people are just a lot healthier nowadays. And so that means that if you retired today, you can expect to live another 20 to 30 active years on average into your retirement. And they're finding that this has actually created a whole new stage of life. They're calling it the second adulthood. And so what's happening is people are leaving their careers after 30 or 40 years, and they're suddenly, suddenly finding themselves on this journey of trying to find their place in this world all over again. And they're discovering that the retirement that they had planned just isn't as fulfilling as they thought it would be. It's too much leisure and not enough purpose. And so this trend that we're seeing over and over again is people actually opting out of a leisure-based retirement and into some form of work. They're going back to some form of work because it gives them a sense of purpose. Michael Sperry is a, a guy who's been around Pathway for a very long time, and he has a great story on how God has led him to a ministry where he's been able to find purpose in the midst of his retirement. Let's listen to this. I'm Michael Sperry, and I'm leading the effort to grow Pathway Community Church online. So I retired in November and uh, immediately dove into this. I think uh, first meeting was Monday morning after retirement with Jim and we uh, sat down and talked about uh, my vision for Church Online and uh, where I thought this could go. And uh, he liked what he, what he heard and began to connect me with more people in the church uh, to make things happen and have devoted you know, most of my time since then uh, to growing Church Online. I've always wanted to be in ministry. Uh, coming out of school um, 30 years ago, I had planned on going into ministry full time, and uh, life took a different direction and ended up working, and uh, it was great, it was, uh, it was wonderful. But um, as I began to get closer to retirement, I realized that I really did want to make a difference in the world and really still had that desire to be involved in the church and to be involved in uh, the kingdom of Christ. And so, as my eyes opened to this opportunity online, uh, it, that was a moment I said, that, that, that I've got to pursue that. Um, there's a desire in my heart to do that, and i just really motivated by it. So began to dig in more and more, and uh, that's how I ended up here. <clears throat> we begin to connect our purpose with the work that God is calling us to do when we realize that God simply wants to leverage the things that make us who we are to make a difference in this world. 
You have a personality that no one else has. You have experiences that are unique to you, both good and bad. You have been gifted to do certain things in certain ways that only you can do. And God has birthed within you a passion in response to the problem that's occupying your life. And God just wants to unleash all of those things in the work that he's calling you to do. And so many times we discover that work when God opens our eyes to a problem, as we mentioned earlier. Our hearts are broken and a passion begins to grow. And we simply respond by surrendering ourselves, surrendering ourselves to the work that God has put before us in response to the problem that's occupying us. Rebecca Gent is a friend of ours, and she's a member of Pathway Community Church. And she saw, years ago, she saw the problem of children in majority world countries who were dying due to a lack of accessible health care, in many cases needing procedures that we would consider routine. And this problem became a passion. And now Ray of Hope Medical Missions is the work that God has called her and her husband Carrie to do. Other members of Pathway, you've heard their story, Tommy and Gina Burns could no longer ignore the problem of people living homeless, hungry, and forgotten in our city. This problem birthed a passion within them, and it became the work that they were called to do through Blessed Portion Ministries. Several years ago, Laura Williams, our senior pastor's wife, was moved by the problem of 150 million orphans in the world, and that number is probably a lot higher than that, actually. That problem broke her heart. It grew into a passion, and Pathways True Vine Ministries was the work that God was calling her to start and a work that continues today. The work that God has called us to do is a direct response to the needs around us, and we discover a greater purpose as we make ourselves available to God so that he can work through us to meet those needs. And as long as we have a problem, there will always be a work that God is calling us to do. That's part of our purpose. God, there's a work that God is calling us to do, but the other part, and what I believe is more important, is this, that there's a person God is calling you to become. There's a person God is calling you to become. As I said a moment ago, it's easy for us to find our sense of purpose in what we do, but I believe at the heart of all of this, God's place for you in this world is less about a task to perform and more about the person you're becoming. Because God's primary will for your life is not the achievements you accrue, it's the person you become. God's primary will for your life is not what job you ought to take. It's not primarily situational or circumstantial. It's not mainly the city where you live or whether you get married or what house you ought to be in. God's will, primary will for your life isn't a project. It's the process of you becoming more like his son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 2.6 says that whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And so when we look at the life of Jesus, we find in him the model of what our lives are supposed to look like. Jesus is our role model. Jesus is the OC. He's the original Christian. And our, our, our lives ought to look like Jesus' life. We are called to live as Jesus lived. And so we need to ask ourselves, am I becoming like Jesus? Am I becoming like Jesus? Because the work that God wants to do through you isn't just about a project, but a person. He isn't simply inviting us into a set of activities or a functions or roles to work for work's sake, but he's calling us into a deeper understanding of who we are created to be. He's calling us into a more fulfilling experience in his church. He's calling us into a deeper relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. And so before we get to work, we need to get to know Jesus. We need to spend time in the Word, studying the life of Jesus, how he led, the ways that he demonstrated love to those around him, the things that he valued, the things that he detested. And I want to highlight just a couple of passages that I believe uh, provide a very compelling summary of of Jesus' life and, and should be reflected in his followers. In Matthew chapter 20... Jesus is teaching his disciples, uh, and he's about to drop some significant truth, and he's talking about the Gentile rulers and how they abuse their positional authority not to in in ways that are not going to help the people they lead, but actually harm them. And he tells his disciples, listen, that's not us. That's not how we roll. But instead, he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. When we observe the teachings of Christ, but even more so when we observe his life and his death on the cross, 
we come to understand that we are never more like Jesus than when we are serving others. We are never more like Jesus than when we are serving others. Rick Warren said in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, he just said very simply, to be like Jesus is to be a servant. Plain and simple. To be like Jesus is to be a servant. From his example of washing the disciples' feet to his sacrificial death on the cross, Jesus showed us the pattern of living a truly significant life. And it turns out that significance looks a lot like laying down our lives and serving others. And so the questions we're left with cannot be, will we serve? But it has to be, where will we serve? Who will we serve? There is something God is calling you to do, but more important, importantly, there's a person that he is calling you to become. God has a place for you on his team, and he desires to see you unleashed in the fullness of the life that he planned for you long ago. My name is Emma Herber, and I am a small group leader for Impulse. I'm Jolene Sanderson. I serve in Connection Community. Uh, my name is Andy Rice. My wife and I serve in Impulse. My name is Rick McComb, and I serve in two different ministries, uh, Connection Community and Reengage. I am Stephanie Rice, and I serve in Impulse. I'm Jamie Nicholson, and I've served a pathway uh, in many different areas. I'm Ann Bat, and I have been a pathway for about 15 years, and I serve in a variety of places. Uh, I'm Nate Hitzman. Um, I serve at Pathway. My name is Emily McComb and I serve with Connection Communities and also with Reengage. I'm Jenny Davis, and I serve on a couple different places, um, the worship team, as well as um, we've done some of our family dedications and um, did some missions in Mozambique as well. So I serve because this is my community of believers, and it's what Jesus has called us to do, um, to be a participant and not a not just a spectator. Personally for me, it actually places me into a, a spot of vulnerability so I can think about others versus myself and it's very rewarding because I can be a part of a team environment and be part of something a little bit bigger than me. So um, I'm just thankful to serve and thankful for the people that I'm surrounded with. God is doing a work right here at Pathway. He's doing a work within each of you. You are God's masterpiece. You are precious to him. Your lives matter deeply to God. Your life can count for something because you have a work to do. Your life has purpose, and there's a work that God is calling you to do, but more importantly, there's a person that he's calling you to become. God has a place for you on his team. And throughout this series, we're inviting you to explore how God might unleash your passion and your purpose through areas of serving and ministry right here at Pathway. You know, we often talk about our mission here at Pathway, which is to lead people into a full life found in Jesus Christ. And one of the fundamental experiences that we believe is part of this full life that Christ came so that we might have is serving others. And that's why serve is one of our core values, not because we, we need people to fill a roster so we can make stuff happen around here, but it's because we believe that there is a richer and deeper and more meaningful experience as we model our lives after Christ. And so our questions that we leave with today, again, are, who will you serve? Where will you serve? Now, if you look in those pockets in front of you, in those seatbacks in front of you, there's a handout that looks like this. Uh, it says unleashed at the top of it. You can just pull that out. Take a look at that now, if you would. <clears throat> One of the incredibly unique privileges we have here at Pathway is the opportunity to touch thousands of lives every weekend with the transformational message of full life found in Jesus Christ. And just looking at this space now filled up, I mean, through the course of our three services every weekend, we just see this space flooded. We had over 6,000 people here last week at Easter. We see our, our kids' city place fill up every single week and every single service and our, our youth environments as well filling up throughout the week and we just realize that God has put before us these incredible opportunities to impact so many lives within our community with a, with a message of hope, a message of healing, a message of full life in Christ. And so we've outlined some opportunities for you to join the work that God is doing right here at Pathway where you can make a significant impact on others, and possibly discover your passion and your purpose 
through one of these ministries. And so what I'd like for you to do now is just take a look at those opportunities that we've listed there for you. And the opportunity for you is that if you are not already serving in a ministry here at Pathway, if you are not already serving somewhere here at Pathway, then we invite you to mark the roles that you have an interest in and complete that information below. This is not a commitment on your part. You're not signing up. We're not going to throw you into something next week or anything like that. This is just you saying, I have interest. I'm willing to explore this. I want to talk to somebody and talk about our next steps and see what this could look like. And in just a moment, we're going to sing a song together. And, and I just want to encourage you, this is not a time, as we sing together, as we worship over these, in these closing moments, this is not a time for you to leave. I know a lot of us at this point, we're starting to think about how we can beat the traffic and get to Carroll Road and, and Union Chapel. I get it. Uh, sometimes I'm stuck in that with you. But, but over these next few moments as we worship, this is a time for us to reflect what God is trying to speak to us and the next steps that he's calling us to take. And our hope is that some of you will begin filling out those cards and marking those areas of interest where, where you might discover your, pur- your purpose and your passion. And if that's you, a couple things you can do with this. There's actually one, one thing that you can do with this. As we're singing this song, as we get about midway into this song, you're going to notice that the buckets are being passed. We're not only going to be singing or worship through our singing, we're going to be worshiping through our giving as well through this time. But as those buckets are being passed, you can just drop those cards in that bucket. Those cards will make their way back to us in the office, and somebody will follow up with you. Somebody will get a hold of you because we want to begin a journey with you of discovering where, how God wants to unleash all that he's put within you for his glory and for his church. And we want to walk that journey with you. And so as I said, as we're singing together, as we're worshiping together, we're not going to be just worshiping through song but through our giving. And, and over the course of these next few moments, we have the opportunity to express to God in a tangible way our gratitude. And our faithfulness back to him in response to his faithfulness to us as he has given us so much. And he's called us just to give back a portion of that to him. We're going to respond in that way over these next few moments. And we're also just going to let God speak to us. We're just going to let God do a work in us as he is calling us to do a work, to let him do a work through us. Let's allow him to speak over these next few moments.
you still call out my name and when my flesh is weak will you help me see you are all that I need you are all that I need may this be a cry of our hearts and God give me a Father, thank you for the challenge of your word. God, thank you for the life and breath that you've given us. Lord, for the unique talents, the unique passions. And I pray, God, for each one today that you'd help each of us to see how we can take what you've given and surrender it back to you and allow it to be used in increasingly great ways for the work and service of your kingdom. Lord, would you give us a heart abandoned? And Lord, then would you come and would you do so much more than we could ever imagine. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, you guys are out of here. We're so thankful that you came. We'll see you next weekend.